Welcome uh, to the University Galleries. Uh, uh, we are proud to present today a conversation between Dr. Kaila Cabañas and Professor Jose Luis Falconi. For the launch uh, of uh, Dr. Cabañas' book, Immanent Vitalities, Meaning and Materiality in Modern and Contemporary Art, which, is, uh, which was uh, published by University of California Press in the book series, Studies of Latin American Art, uh, that is a sponsor by the Institute for Studies on Latin American Art, ISLA. Here with us today is also Ariel Asics, president of uh, ISLA, who will be introducing our speakers. As some of you know, <clears throat> ISLA is an institution devoted to advanced scholarship and public engagement with art from Latin America. Through its exhibition program, through university partnerships, publications, often done in collaboration with uh, international universities, museums, and uh, diverse art centers. Ariel Asics is uh, uh, founded ISLA in 2011 in order to raise international visibility and knowledge around art from Latin America. His energetic pursuit of this goal has resulted in collaboration with uh, major institutions across the US, Europe, Central and South America. The publication of new texts on uh, Latin American art is a key aspect of uh, ISLA's activities. In uh, its first uh, 10 years, ISLA has proudly supported more than 20 art history publications, as well as exhibition catalogs and books. The Institute in House uh, Journal, Vistas, publishes works by emerging scholars whose texts are, were written in conjunction with ISLA sponsored programming. ISLA offers a number of opportunities to support scholars and curators researching Latin American art. We invite you to visit the, their website, isla.org, to learn more about their program activities. I will uh, copy the uh, website address in the chat in the youtube chat so that it is easy for you to locate their, their website and now i will leave you with uh, ariel asics who will be introducing this evening speakers hola thank you for that great introduction jesus hello everybody thank you all for tuning in to this webinar I am happy to introduce Kyra Cavania's Imminent Vitalities, Meaning and Materiality in Modern and Contemporary Art. I am even happier that my organization, ISLA, teamed up with the University of California Press to publish it. When we initiated this series with UCP a few years ago, we couldn't have imagined a better outcome than Kyra's wonderful new book. Imminent Vitalities, is a very important addition to our growing list in this series, which is titled Studies on Latin American Art. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce Dr. Jose Falconi, who will join Kyra in conversation this evening. Jose is a leading presence in theorizing contemporary art, and he has published books on artists, including Darío Escobar, Jorge Mario Munera, and Pedro Reyes with, universe, with Harvard University Press. In his own words, Jose is a lecturer of Latin American art in the Department of History of Art and Architecture at Brandeis University, as well as the president of Cultural Agents, Inc., an NGO that promotes civic engagement and creativity through artistic education. His monograph on Mexican artist Pia Camille, There Are No Friendly Fires, is forthcoming in 2021. Jose earned his PhD from Harvard University in Romance Languages and Literature. Kaira, as you know, is professor of global, global modern and contemporary art history and affiliate faculty in the Center for Latin American Studies at the University of Florida in Gainesville. She earned her bachelor's degree from Duke University, an MA in the art in the history of art from Yale University and a PhD in art and archaeology with a graduate certificate in media and modernity from Princeton University. She is the author of an exceptional body of work, including three previously published books, 
In addition to volumes she has edited and journal articles she has written. Realmente no sé cómo haces Kyra para hacer tantas cosas. Kyra's Imminent Vitality is an excellent volume, impeccably researched, carefully written, and thoroughly grounded in both history and theory. The book offers a fresh and insightful perspectives on a wider range of artistic and, and art critical practices in post 1950s Brazil, Venezuela, and France. Imminent Vitalities is composed of six main chapters in which Kairos draws on the object-oriented ontology of what has come to be called as the new materialisms. The artists and critics whose work she explores range for the by now fairly well-known, such as Ligia Clark, Mario Pedrosa, Gego, and Alejandro Otero, to the considerably less familiar, such as Janira, Alessandro Valteo Jasbeck, Mateus Roja Pita, and Daniel Stigman Mangrane. With this excellent book, Kyra continues to shape the field of Latin American art history in significant ways. Her contributions to the field speak directly to the mission that drives Isla, to tell fuller histories of art by representing the breadth, richness, and global resonance of Latin American culture, cultural production. I am grateful to Kyra for her outstanding scholarship on artists who have long deserved this kind of rigorous attention. I hope there is time in the question and answer period to hear how Kyra thinks that this volume relates to the larger body of work and her evolving intellectual commitments and concerns. But for now, it is my great pleasure to welcome Kyra and thank her for writing such an impressive book. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ariel, for that very generous introduction. I'd like to thank both Ariel Asics and Isla for their support of scholarship and curatorial exhibitions in relation to the art of Latin America. Um, both Ariel and Isla are really models of um, patronship of scholarship and rigorous scholarship. So I'm really indebted to the series and to all of the work you've done both with University of California Press, but also beyond. I'm grateful to Jesus Fuenmayor for the invitation to present this book at University Galleries in this virtual format and to Danny Sensabaugh for her work as graduate assistant and being in charge of the promotions and technological platform this evening. I'm also delighted that my longtime friend and colleague Jose Falconi will be joining me in conversation this evening. At the University of Cali California Press, I'm you know, indebted to Nadine Little, a former art history director, as well as Arshana Patel, the current art history editor, for backing the project, as well as for their production and promotions team. It's just been excellent working with them at every step of the way. And I'd also like to thank the, the series editor, Alexander Albero, for his support of the project, but also his continued support of my work. So many um, individuals I owe and am constantly indebted to. A book is not just one's own work, but also emerges from the conversations that one has with various individuals. At the University of Florida, my colleagues in art history have been especially supportive, and I'll just single out Rachel Silveri for her generous feedback on the book manuscript. There are many more individuals named in the book's in, in acknowledgments, but here I would like to single out a few other individuals for their sustained gestures of generosity and care. Elizabeth Azen, Sonia Bos, Birir Lipinski, Ana Magallais, Sergio Marchins, Lexis Novoa, Fernanda Pita, Mateos Rochapita, Larcio Redondo, and Katya Celia. And finally, I end by thanking um, Jesus Fuenmayor. So full disclosure, for those of you who don't know, Jesus is also my life partner, and we take care of a beautiful little boy named Gael. You might hear interrupt this non-regularly scheduled broadcast. So um, with that, I will be reading tonight from the book's preface, which will cover some of the ground that Ariel introduced I'll be reading from the blog post on the book and also the preface. I think I started saying introduction. So preface, blog post, and introduction. And so with that, if we could bring the slide um, program to the screen, please. Thank you. 
And so I'm going to be reading and the slides will just be circulating as I read because most of what I will be talking about really is more part biographical and part methodological and in inflection. So from the preface, how did contemporary art and its discourse arrive at a moment in which the art object has gone from being conceived as an inert autonomous object to a material reality exhibiting its own agency? Imminent vitalities, meaning and materiality in modern and contemporary art responds to this question by turning to a range of artistic practices that developed in Venezuela and Brazil. I investigate these practices along with the artist's connections to Europe to chart specific cases of global modern and contemporary art that engage changing conceptions of materiality, whereby artists disavow the conceptual constraints that could claim matter as inert substance that place the inorganic in opposition to the organic and that position human objectivity in opposition to things. Consequently, this study advances how art as material object and material practice serves as a fitting model for thinking through the entanglements of materiality and subjectivity. So one inspiration for this book is Gabriel Perez Barreiro's 2006 conference on modern and contemporary art from Latin America at UT Austin, which he organized on occasion of the new Blanton Museum of Arts reopening. The event was notable for bringing together leading professionals in the field, artists, curators, and academics. Almost 15 years later, I vividly recall the moment when Walgercio Caldas pulled a piece of plastic out of his pocket, setting it on the table next to himself and Gabriel during their public conversation. Suddenly, this plastic began to shift, its creases unraveled, its semi-opacity became increasingly translucent. The material came alive before the public's eyes. I might imagine that Caldas was doubling down on how materiality impinges on artistic representation as well as on art's reception. And he did so with his characteristic elegance married to his craftiness in staging this visual surprise. Here, materiality trumped verbal discourse on art. And since then, the magic of the material he pulled out of his pocket has lived on in my thinking such that this scene has unwittingly served as a point of departure for some of the concerns articulated in this book. Imminent Vitalities is the result of my long-standing investment in the art of Latin America, an elaboration of intellectual interests that extend to my undergraduate years. I completed a bachelor's in comparative area studies at Duke University, choosing Latin America as my primary region and Western Europe as my secondary region. My first publication in art history, written while I was still an undergraduate in 1995, was on the performance work of Ana Mendieta. Researching her practice became a way for me to explore a migrant experience through art and the daughter of a Cuban immigrant and a Cuban exile, and to begin to claim art history as an academic discipline to which I could belong. When I entered graduate school in art history, initially at Yale and later at Princeton, art critics from Latin America, such as Mario Pedrosa, Marta Traba, Gerardo Mosquera, were familiar to me, while the critics of the Anglo-American tradition were decidedly not. I recall thinking, who is this Clement Greenberg everyone is talking about? And feeling utterly mortified that I did not know. Alongside my graduate studies of Euro-American art, I began researching and publishing articles on major figures of 20th century art in Latin America. Because modern art in Latin America was not taught in the graduate programs I attended, at Yale, I designed a syllabus on the region's conceptualist practices for an independent study with Dr. Kelly Jones, for whom I later worked as a research assistant, producing an annotated bibliography on art in Latin America from independence to the present, and that was in 2000. And some days I feel like these two tracks, right? Studying Euro-American art and studying the art of Latin America. You know, some days I call it a double duty or a double responsibility. And then other days based on my level of exhaustion, I think of it as a double burden, but I do think that it is, um, one is tasked um, with knowing both contexts fully. So such work commingled with my research on Euro-American art and provided further evidence of the connections that existed in the visual arts among cultures that did not grow up separately from one another, but were always already intertwined through colonial histories, cultural policies, and migrations. And this is my favorite image in the book, actually, of Gago smoking as she installs her chotros. Okay, I'm going to read from the blog post now. 
The blog post was titled, Who's Global Modernism? And it's on the University of California Press website. So in a recent interview with Jose Falconi, who will be joining me shortly in conversation after this presentation, he inquired about my critique of the global contemporary paradigm within academia in the United States as it relates to research on modern art in Latin America. To me, the biggest blind spot in the 2010s of the expansion into a so-called global modern art history is that it mainly operates within an assimilationist logic. Whether it is global pop or global surrealism, English speaking scholars and curators impose names and strategies from avant-garde movements in Western art history on singular practices that emerged in the global South. In so doing, aesthetic similarities trump differences, generalities triumph over specificity. In the specific case of surrealism, I'm always reminded of how I tell my students how Frida Kahlo confessed, I'm now quoting Frida Kahlo, I never knew I was a surrealist until Andre Breton came to Mexico and told me I was, end quote. Filmmaker Glaber Pocha also once wrote, and I quote, our surrealism is not the surrealism of dreams, but that of reality, end quote. In my previous book, Learning from Madness, Brazilian Modernism and Global Contemporary Art, my conception of monolingualism of the global related only in part to linguistic competency. The concept diagnosed a condition, the intellectual failure to reckon with how aesthetic categories and movements are neither neutral nor natural containers of information. From an ethical perspective, I find it important to remember that hegemonic constructions and power relations have not disappeared with the emergence of the global contemporary. They subsist, but in a new guise. Integrating work from Latin America into global art history abandons one type of epistemic control and inscribes the work within a dominant language that retains the privilege of making the art of others legible and knowable, even global. Knowledge production is revealed as a one-way street of appropriation and reassertion of discursive power. Consequently, I often say that today global is just a veiled way of saying non-Western. Modernist art history in the United States mainly upholds a division between modernism and global modernism. The first unmarked term, modernism, imputes authenticity and primacy to modernism in the West while maintaining a cultural hierarchy by deliberately casting global in a secondary position. No scholar in the United States uses global to designate Western modernism, and precious few scholars in the global South describe their work on modernism as global. And that is true, particularly for academics in Brazil, which is the context I'm most familiar with. Global modernism is the product of a Western episteme that belatedly discovered and felt responsible to modernisms that were already there. In short, global modernism is a Western category. One must also interrogate prevailing Western expectations and implicit bias regarding the types of scholarship that can be produced about specific regions of the world and about non-hegemonic communities. It is a key scholarly responsibility and one that has been intensifying recently with urgent calls to examine the inequities and colonial histories that subtend, the, that subtend the discipline of art history. In my own scholarship, what has largely been non-negotiable has been my refusal to perform what would be recognized as scholarship by a Latina. Even so, I'm always amazed how many colleagues ask if I'm Brazilian or Venezuelan. None have ever asked me if I'm French. In short, I intentionally trouble essentialist assumptions that would tie my ethnic identity to the content of my scholarly output. And it's important for me here to say that it doesn't tie me to the content or to the representations of my scholarly output, because I believe very firmly that my positionality as an ethnic minority informs my criticality and how I choose to address and write about the subjects I write. Okay, so now I'll read from the introduction. And I'm hoping that with the introduction, you'll get more of a sense of um, some of the projects that are addressed in, in the book, and that hopefully there'll be moments when what I say will coincide also within, with an image on the screen. So I'll try and cue my speech also uh, to the images as well. And so this is, of course, the book cover with the fabulous Gago on it. So the work of art is expressed as a living object 
like you and I. The surface should be like an organic body, like a living entity. Throughout her career, artist Ligia Clark penned these and similar statements in which she described the art object as a living being in ways that unsettled distinctions between the organic and inorganic nature and culture. From her conceptualization of the organic line to affirmations that each bisho is an organic entity, it is a living organism, essentially an active work. Art critic and poet Ferreira Goulart captured Clark's and the neo-concrete movement's thinking when he wrote, and I quote, if we must look for an equivalent for the work of art, we will thus find it neither in the machine nor in the object, but rather in living organisms, end quote. In Imminent Vitalities, Meaning and Materiality in Modern and Contemporary Art, I delve into the active work, the liveliness of artworks that Clark's statements and practice cast in relief. I discuss how Alejandro Otero's work in Paris and Caracas echoes phenomenological discussions of color's perceptual emergence, how art critic Mario Pedrosa's engagement with interwar European psychology was adapted to his vision for an aesthetic modernism in, Bra in Brazil underwritten by affect. And De Janeira, a largely self-taught artist, paints a visible world that is brought into being through shapes and color, but also through the corporeal labor of production and the economy. How a German Jewish immigrant to Caracas, Gertrude Goldschmidt, more commonly known as Gego, turned to non-classical science as an inspiration for her innovative sculptural practice. Alicia Clark's object-oriented therapy contrasts with Lettris Isidore Izu's contemporary therapeutic proposals in Paris in the late 1960s. And so beyond art as a kind of discrete object or entity, I also turn to contemporary artists. Alessandro Valteo Yazbek situates the imminent relationality of natural and cultural forces alongside broader socio-political frameworks while Mateos Rochapita, whose works you see now on the screen, explores a commodity's use rather than its reification as part of a personal ritual acts. And this is from his exhibition, which took place in Milan in 2015. Here, the agency of the art spectator is not a property of the person, but the enactment of possibilities that arise in relation to art as a material object and or action. We might thus think of the specific cases presented in this book in relation to the new materialisms that have gained prominence since the early 2000s and that developed upon theories of material performativity from the 1980s. With the term imminent vitality, I deliberately draw upon concepts from the new materialisms in order to capture how these artists' works confront binary distinctions such as mind matter and culture nature, cutting across oppositions to introduce qualitative shifts in our understanding of what is inert versus living, passive versus active. In particular, Karen Barad's related notions of entanglement and interaction are particularly resonant with my approach. Expanding on the lessons of quantum physics and the philosophical insights of Niels Bohr, she affirms how, and I quote, the very act of measurement produces determinate boundaries and the properties of things, end quote, thereby acknowledging that scientific observation does not represent, but rather produces its object of study within a continual process of cutting together apart. Barad's provocative elaboration of Niels Bohr presents at once a theory of knowledge and of being's relationality. Maurice Merleau-Ponty's observation about the implications of quantum physics for a relational ontology is also relevant in this context. Merleau-Ponty wrote, and I quote, today the very rigor of physics description obliges it to recognize as ultimate physical beings in full right relations between the observer and the observed, end quote. And in this context, I think it's important to remember that uh, Maurice Merleau-Ponty's reception uh, in Brazil was very key to the development of Lucia Clark's work, but also Ferreira Goulart's theorization of the neo-concrete movement. Throughout the book's chapters, I advance the notion of vitality as an animation or force that is at once imminent to and other to form. 
Over the course of the book, I track such liveliness within ever increasing subject object entanglements and the complex relations of which art and its materialization forms a part. My aim with Imminent Vitalities is to prompt readers to rethink materiality through artistic practices so as to affirm what escapes aesthetic representation and by extension, philosophical representationalism while remaining attentive to social differences and lived experience. So in Brazil and in Venezuela, the 1950s, the decade with which this volume begins, was a time when developmentalism, a constructive visual language, and national identity came together to project an image of a modern nation. Art critic Mario Pedrosa and artist Alejandro Otero, whose coloritmos you see on the screen now, both supported the aesthetic trends toward geometric abstraction in their respective countries, concrete art in, Venez in Brazil, excuse me, and kinetic art in Venezuela. Each, so both Pedrosa and Otero, insisted on the universality and specificity of painting, but did so paradoxically by exploring non-rationalist and non-idealist aesthetic models. Pedrosa continually defended affect in art, while Otero turned to color in painting as a vital force. And this image is a quite exceptional exhibition of his coloritmos that happened at the Pinacoteca do Estado de São Paulo um, in, I believe it must have been 2012 to 2013. In the case of imminent vitalities, my embrace of a less rigid subject-object divide is in part due to how I trace the dynamic interplay between Western and non-Western views while remaining attuned to the migration of people, objects, and ideas between Western Europe and South America. On account of such movements, I insist on displacing the use of Latin American as an adjective, as in Latin American art, and instead foreground multiple prepositions, in, of, and from, as an anti-essentializing anti gesture, and especially as a refusal to reduce art to geography and artists and artistic practice, to national identities. I propose that the cumulative effect of such an approach that takes geopolitical alignments and international cultural policy as the primary framework for how art signifies has been paradoxically to isolate Latin America as a separate geographic and self-sufficient field, evinced by the increasing number of conference panels, academic journals, and tenure track lines dedicated to Latin American art visual and visual culture in addition to the studies on Latin American art series, which Imminent Vitalities is just one part. The approach has also produced an implicit academic bias. When one writes about the modern and contemporary art of Latin America, one needs to provide more cultural context to let geopolitics lead the way, while theoretically informed art history seems to remain doggedly within the purview of Euro-American modernist art histories. When producing idea-driven books about modern European or post-war American art, art historians, myself included, are rarely asked to further unpack the shifting geopolitical horizons of art in order to legitimate its meaning. Rather, such horizons are taken as given or known to the English-speaking readers in question. To be sure, mine is not a call for a renewed attention to exclusively formal analysis. Rather, it is an appeal to have aesthetic material structure and theoretical analyses lead the way within art history and the study of modern art from Latin America more specifically. And to have these analyses inform the disciplines and arts purchase on social worlds. Written from my institutional position within US academia and in part with this public in mind, I maintain a healthy skepticism toward the academic bind described above. Following Yves Lambois, I described geopolitical bias as a type of blackmail. That is, the institutional and intellectual pressures described above seem to suggest that one who writes about art from Latin America for English speaking audiences is obligated to offer a geopolitical interpretation of the art if it is to have meaning. Consequently, with imminent vitalities, I deliberately engage a twofold strategy of epistemic delinking. First, the study foregrounds theoretical, aesthetic, and material problematics rather than geopolitics to provide a philosophically informed but not determined reading of select artistic practices from the 1950s to the present. 
Second, the volume discusses these modern and contemporary artistic practices from Latin America in light of how they resonate with the new materialism's theoretical concerns, thereby challenging recent art-related appropriations of new materialisms that treat it as exclusive to new developments in Western epistemology. Such an approach produces a different materialization of art's histories. Accordingly, the material aesthetic relations and theoretical affinities between the chapters motivate their organization, while the historicization of culturally specific concerns remains operative throughout. Indeed, the vital materiality at the heart of the work explored in each chapter is time and again married to social, political, ethical, and even therapeutic concerns. Key here is that Imminent Vitalities is a critical take on modernism and contemporary art. In short, theoretically innovative and critical modernist art history can be produced in, of, and from Latin America. So I would like to thank you all for um, listening to my presentation and um, would also now like to invite Jose Falconi to join me on the screen. Hey, Kaida. Yeah. Can you can you guys hear me? Can you hear me, Kaida? Yo te oigo bien, sí. Perfecto. And it's, it's good to have that doubleness. I mean, here in 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 uh, in clear performance. First of all, I my role here is just um, like el, 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 como el bautizo, no, de un bebé, I mean, of, a, of a, the baptism of a of a new baby. And um, I wanted to talk to you about a, about a, ask you a few questions, basically mainly on the process of the book, um, on the process of writing the book. Um, because I think it's something that people will not be able to really know later, you know, I mean, um, but I want to say three things. First of all, first of all, congratulations, felicitaciones, parabéns, you know, all the languages that we can find, you know, I mean, uh, um, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, and, and I want to congratulate not only you, but all of us, really. I mean, actually, it's a congratulations to... Um, not only that, but also to all of us in terms of the field, in terms of the Latin American field for the book. Um, it is a very, there are three things that I, I think that are clear about the book, uh, that make very clear about the book. First of all, the um, the fact that, you know, as you have already mentioned, there was a, this is a secreto a voces, it's not even a, a, a voice for all, uh, secret, but you have been a major voice in Latin American art for a long time. And um, but there was now that there is a book that quote unquote says Latin America, quote unquote, you know, I mean to some degree, you know, is is makes it like you know, makes it uh quote unquote official. And this is just like you know, not um not um you had a previous book on Brazil. Uh, you had a, an enormous amount of work that you have been doing over the last, I would say, 20 years, you know, uh, of Latin America. So that is the first thing that, you know, first of all, you know, um, second, the second thing that I want to say is that it's super important to realize, um, and just by the publication that Isla, by what Ariel is doing, but um, to, to, to also realize how dynamic the American, the feel of, Latin American is in the United States is, you know, is, is being, um, um, I mean, is being, has been growing exponentially and is highly dynamic and is an important force to be reckoned with. And the third thing, and I want to congratulate you particularly on this, and I think it's important for the field to, to, to read this book, uh, is the fact that you're extremely precise and not only delicate, but rigorous, um, expo I mean, clear presentation of each of the cases that you present in the book. I mean, the six or seven essays that you have here with six or seven different cases, you know, these are like very detailed, very, very, um, um, this tone of, there is a ton of, um, of, of research being done, and there is an extremely careful examination, which produce incredibly nuanced texts. 
And that is very, very important for us, for not only methodologically, for every new student to see what it can be achieved by careful examination. But not only because of that, but also something that you have already said in your presentation, that it, it is not, if you want to expand the notion, if you want to expand, quote unquote, the notion of what people are working with, you know, in terms of this bland globalism, you know, that the people are like, you know, jumping into, it necessarily implies to basically problematize the notion of context, you know, the very notion of context. And you are being an enormous and a very clear example of someone who has basically have gone to Brazil, for example, gone, I mean, spent enormous amount of time in the region in order to be able to problematize that very notion of context. It's not just whatever the United States, you know, brings in terms of a category for whatever context is. It also implies to move what is happening in the region. And what has been the, 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 the position in the region? Again, we discussed that, you and I have been discussing that a long time about like monolingualism of the global, you know, that, that I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very, very solid uh, and interesting category, which denotes basically the limitations of, as I say, a toothless way of, of entering into the world, which, as you will say, replicate the same schemas and the same problems instead of really changing them or challenging them. So I want to say those three things. Um, again, it is a major, it is a major uh, moment, I think, for, for our field in that regard. Uh, secondly, um, and then now I want to enter into questions for you because, you know, um, people are going to be able to read the book and going to be able to really become really um, marble about like, you know, some of the very, very fine readings that you have. Let me let me ask you this. Um, this book implied some sort of reprocessing, reframing of some of your essays, and that's super not only uh, valiente. You know, it's difficult to go back to older texts to look at them and to reframe them. Could you tell us a little bit about that process of, like, you know, making a, a self archaeology to some degree and then rehashing them under? new horizons, you know, in this case, the materiality aspect of it was always lingering there, but then you have to reposition it again. Maybe that's, uh, maybe we can start from there. Sure. I mean, I think in, in response to the, the process of revisiting many of these texts, um, just to explain to those uh, watching, you know, have earlier versions that as Jose and some other people in the field have been aware of, right? Mm -hmm. And and I felt personally tasked with making some of that work visible in the form of a book. Mm -hmm. um, and um, <laughs> so going back, so one, I think it was, quite, so there's a key moment in my time in Brazil when I came to understand that subjectivity as it is posited in the United States as a kind of having an agency over things or even participation in art, that that is about the subjective agency of the individual, but that does not obtain in the case of somebody like Lucia Clark. It doesn't obtain in the case of Mateo Shroshapita who creates rituals that are not about the personality of the individual, right? And so, and so then it's like, well, so then what is that, what is that doing in relation to objects and materials? Mm -hmm. And so that was one way that I began to kind of think around that. That is not to say that it was like a really challenging because, you know, I say in the introduction that I, you know, I ended up not dealing. I mean, I wasn't, you know, I mean, I think it would be a little traumatic for me to go back and like revisit Ana Mendieta text because that's <laughs> like, 1995, I'm an undergrad. I'm writing it for very specific reasons in terms of how do I, you know, project myself into the field of art history, right? And it was, you know, and that's like my 21 year old self. So that didn't seem appropriate. Um, but then, you know, it could have gone other ways. I, I do, I will say that I chose in some aspects more recent texts. I think that mm -hmm. if I had the wherewithal, I probably could have gone back and rethought um, my 2003 text on Sildo Mereles, because I think there's a lot of questions of material, um, particularly it comes up later in the chapter on Mateo Sorchapita, but I mean, I think I could have done that too, but it didn't, because it was kind of framed within more of um, 
conceptual art and conceptualist practices of the region, it didn't lend itself to a kind of archaeology of my intellect in the same way that some of the other works did. So on the one hand, it was Brazil and this question of subjective agency and how it's displaced in certain um, works of art of particular artists. And then the other was a more recent text, um, you know, Jesus Juan Mayor, he curated Gago, a Gago exhibition of Los Chorros um, a couple of years back and invited me to write a text in that context. And there I was very much concerned with why is it that everybody's talking about her work in relation to trees and nature when she works with metal? Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And so then, mm -hmm. like, how do we approach her metal, right? And the, the liveliness internal to metal or how her metal is able to suggest that it's alive without with, while being static, right? Yeah. So it was a kind of lateral move to go from that and thinking, you know, questions of kinetic art in the Brazilian, I mean, in the Venezuelan context, to this question of how matter can come alive within a resolutely static object, but which also challenges traditional conventions of sculptural production in terms of mass and volume. Mm -hmm. So I think those two angles were two ways in which I, you know, on the one hand, Gago and thinking about her work more recently, and then on the other hand, this question of displacing subjective agency, which I think is very prominent also in Laura Lima. Yeah, that's an incredible, that is an incredible show. You know, that was an incredible show, yeah. Yeah, and so, yeah. so I think those those two aspects were how I kind of arrived at that. But I did have to kind of decide to not use a lot. So I know, because, I mean, I I remember reading, the first time you ever came to my radio was a text that you wrote on Gego a long, long time ago that probably is not the one that is, I mean, it's not the one that's here, you know. I mean, uh, I mean, I was talking about 2006, 2007 text, you know. I mean, yeah. um, uh, just... I wanted to go uh, ask you rapidly questions, you know, we can, we can make this a little bit fun, but you already ruined my first question, you know, because uh, you said, you said that, yeah, you said that the bet that the image was, um, that your your favorite image was uh, the Gego one, but the then give me then the second best image. The second best. The, the second best. <laughs> now I have to think, I love the one of Gego. I do love the one of, um, oh, let me think. Second favorite image after Gago smoking. I, I do like the one of Alejandro Otero with like the colorimo perched on his leg because yeah. I think it shows a kind of object relation to to that support. You don't really see that so often in terms of you know portraits of artists. So I mean, if I yeah, with, you're you're totally right, you know, yeah. So if I stick within portraiture and I stuck within mm -hmm. Venezuela in that in that case, but I would yeah, the, the Otero. I mean, uh, I mean, and all of and all of these texts, you know, obviously, you know, everybody thinks of their texts as, you know, as like, you no, know, our babies, you know, that they have more or less the same sort of, uh, same sort of law for each of them, you know. But if you were to ask, if were to ask you, which was, which is the one that you like the most out of this? Which is the one that you think, you know? I mean, I want to. I mean, you have just said about something about like the Sildo Medele text that was that is underneath there, and I hope that becomes a project. I mean, a real book because we need to keep reading you, you know. But uh, I mean, we would love to have a, a, a book on Sildo by Kaida will be incredible, you know. Uh, add, add, add to that what I tells you, you know. Uh, but which is the one that you you like the you like the archaeology of yourself more? I mean, uh, to to look at to when to haven't gone back and the one that you like the most. Look, I think I enjoyed writing uh, the chapter on Mateo Shoshapita because I was there in Milan. Um, there's also a series of Polaroids in which I enact that ritual of opening the opening the loaf with the bread that falls out. And, you know, and then revisiting that was also at the time of the refugee crisis of Venezuela, which continues, right, with Venezuela, um, Venezuela yeah. refugees, the largest, you know, crisis in terms of refugees in modern Latin American history. And so, and so then it was able to, you know, he departs from a kind of, let's say, exile experience and then it kind of returned. And so I would say that probably in terms of um, my own present affective investment in the artistic practice and the artist in question as well, I think that that um, seems very proximate to mm -hmm. to you too. To the, yeah. I'm gonna do this quick. I should answer in two seconds, then we can. Come ah, that's fine. That's fine. I mean, I mean, I mean, but maybe, maybe we. I mean, we don't have a lot of time. You know, we only have like you know because we have a we have like basically six, seven more minutes. But maybe, maybe I want to ask you. Maybe, maybe let's move from the from the fast questions because there is something that you said about this notion of of vitality. You know, and I mean that that I mean the the notion of 
something that is living, you know. Maybe maybe you want to talk a little. I mean, want to maybe we want to say something a little bit more about that. I mean, I think it's it's what the book hinges on to some degree. You know, I mean, the the, the imminence of that, the, the the continuous latency of that within the object, and what you have just already talked about, what uh, what the Gego and uh, and Otero did. You know, I mean, maybe maybe we can maybe we can open that a little bit more. Because I think that is because I think that is a very very you know fertile ground. I mean, not only because it touches on 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 new materialities and and the whole nine yard, but you know, but there is something to be said there about as you have just said, the fact that it doesn't hold you know in the notion of the, the regular notion of subject object division, you know, that is in which everything is is presented, you know. <laughs> well, I think that the, that relation, the question of vitality, shifts over the chapters, right? So initially. Um, you know, we're talking about modernist art, mm -hmm. artists, right? And and they're very invested in their materials and yeah. a certain sense of at least a partial autonomy of the work of art, right? And so it's really a question of thinking about the animations internal to form um, that change our relationship to those forms as viewers. But once you get to, you know, Alessandro's work or Mateos's work, then I think the vitality is a question of the relation. And so particularly in Mateus's work, it's the vitality that happens between the object as a kind of material object or action in our, you know, inscription within a work of art in which our subjectivity is kind of displaced in favor of this wow. vitality that happens in this relation. Of course, in the case of Mateus Roshapita, and I'll just stay there because I, I've mm -hmm. already kind of described it, I mean, there's also then the literal vitality of opening this loaf of bread and having sand come out of it. And when you're engaging with the bread, you're kind of, you know, noticing the discrepant materiality on the inside. So there's a kind of vitality into it, but the vitality is not that per se. It's really the kind of inscription with a kind of within this, what I call an apersonal ritual. Mm -hmm. so. Wonderful. What What is next? I mean, as Ariel said, you know, we're all in awe about how much you do and how much, how, how and not only how much, how how good it is, you know? So could you please, I mean, what is what is next? I mean, could you tell us a little bit what is what is next on the, in the, um, in the horizon, in the near horizon? Sure. Um, so I think that there's, I think the, the book, on, I mean, the chapter on Lucia Clark is chapter five or six, no me acuerdo. Yeah, hold on a second, let me see. I have, I'm uh -huh. one of the lucky, lucky ones that have already the book here, so, and by the way, go and get it. You know, I mean, I think that um, um, it is it is incredible. So, hold on one second. Let me see. It's okay. Well, the chapter on Lucia Clark and Isidore Izu, um, mm -hmm. and I, I will call out my my friends Lula Vanderlei and Gina Ferreira, who you know as well, who I believe oh, yeah. are, who are watching in Brazil now. That the next project will kind of be an extension of that particular chapter which deals more with the material that was also at the heart of learning from madness which is the intersection between modern art and psychiatry so chapter five i'm totally obsessed um to do my research on the intersection of psychiatric reform and creativity and artistic practice in the context of brazil france algeria and then there was one more context but no me acuerdo. I don't remember. <laughs> well, it will. I mean, Italy, Italy, Italy France, Italy, Italy, Algeria, and Brazil. Wonderful. So, um, so in that way, it's much more of an idea-driven book, um, mm -hmm. because I want to kind of follow my thinking about how psychiatric practice and the creative practices that are internal to it have impacted um, not only questions of psychiatric reform and what I call creative care, but also have had avant-garde artists actually working in those contexts as well so mm -hmm. wonderful because this links us to the question you know that uh we have here you know by uh fernanda fernanda pita you know who basically says like uh let me read this let me read this this question in your chapter on the work of Lydia clark and isidore Su, you explore the idea of aban of abandonment in the work of art and uh, in, in the work of clark could you please expand on this idea yeah so so, I mean, Lucia Clark, The Abandonment of Art was the title of the retrospective at MoMA, right? Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure MoMA has a very um, challenging protocols in terms of who is titled, who, who titles what, right? <laughs> but I think that the idea that Lucia Clark moved from producing 
works of art to collective experiences, sensorial experiences. And then ultimately when she returns to Rio in 1976, she's doing her therapy to individ for individual clients, right? And so I think this is the moment when, you know, people will say she abandoned art. So she also has another citation, a quote where she says that she's interested in an art situation without art. So I've been kind of obsessing about this quote recently because, as you know, I retired from art history. On I know, I know that, yeah. September 19th, I retired from art history. My students and maybe two other people know you, Jesus, and one other person. And, um, and so I was, and I've been thinking, you know, at the time I joked, I was like, what do you do when you retire from art history? I can't play chess, mm -hmm. like, pump. I mean, like, what does that mean? And so I've been trying to think of, like, my own challenges with kind of, institutionalized art history, let's say, that I think might capture a little bit what Lucia Clark was trying to say when she was interested in an art situation without art. And I recently read, and this is, you know, I think has to do with this, I, I don't think it's an abandonment of art, maybe it's just an abandonment of the institutional context of art, I still think she's invested in art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, um, Luis, Luis Camilo Osorio, who you know is a philosopher and mm -hmm. at he recently sent me a text and he had this wonderful displacement where he says, maybe we shouldn't talk about what is art, but when art happens. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that that was, you know, I mean, and this also obtains when we think about Latin American art. Why, why are we trying to constantly like define the ontology of like, what is Latin American art? Mm -hmm. I think it's much more interesting is like, well, when does art happen? When, mm -hmm. And when it happens might be different based on different cultural contexts. And so when art happens in Ligia Clark is not an abandonment, maybe read within the horizon of Brazilian culture, but is read potentially as an abandonment in, in the U.S. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that yeah. is a satisfying answer, but I do think the shift from the ontological what to the kind of temporal when. Yeah. yeah. Um, at least, at least water this down to a little bit, you know, I mean, and, and makes it not that complicated, the whole issue, you know, I mean, it makes it not, not that, you know, very good. Let me, um, there is another one here by um, your colleague Sergio Vega, um, who says, from your approach to Latin American, uh, to Latin America, one could say that identity politics is a strategy that has been on, on some way exhausted in that context. Can we learn something from the exhaustion of identity policies in Latin America that can be translated into other contexts? Okay, can you reread that one more time? Yeah, yeah. From your approach to Latin American, uh, one could say that identity politics is a strategy that has been in some way exhausted in that context. In the, and, yeah, in the context of Latin America, I guess. You know, can uh, can we learn something from the exhaustion of identity politics in Latin America that can be translated into other contexts? Well, okay. So, you know, um, that's not a question I deal with directly in, mm -hmm. in my book, but I'm happy. I'm going to, but I'm going to answer it in reference to somebody else. So, I mean, I was reading your wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you. I can send this to Sergio. Oh, please. wonderful. I was reading Luis Enrique mm -hmm. uh, discussion in there where, you know, he is talking about the situation in the U.S. as a kind of multicultural essentialism. And he, he contrasts that with questions of mestizaje mm -hmm. in Latin America. And of course, mm -hmm. mestizaje is different. It's 23 countries. It's yeah. not similarly obtained everywhere. And, um, you know, so I think that... I think more, what can the US learn from Latin America, right? Um, mm -hmm. Would be my response to that. Mm -hmm. What can the US learn from, from Latin America rather than Latin America importing um, new, yeah. You know, a kind of sometimes, you know, the US, which has no great history in race relations, you know, still posits itself at times, you know, vis a vis the South as a kind of moral arbiter, but maybe it could learn something from the South. I would say learn from South. That's that's wonderful. That's wonderful learning from the South. I mean, that is a that is excellent. I mean, I guess, and I guess that you know that. Um, let me see. If we have one more question here because we don't have a lot of time. We only have like three, basically three more minutes. Um, um, five minutes. Five so, minutes. Okay, so one more question. Back to your uh, list, Jose. You had a list to get it. We can. <laughs> I continue. I continue with the list. You know. Um, 
let me yeah i mean while while, while we bring another question you know uh which of the i mean you you said that you like you like very much the um one particular essay you know about the uh, mateo rocha pita you know you like to we'll go back to it mm -hmm. and let me ask you about like you know in that in in that sense which was which of them was is the one that you feel the fondest in in terms of uh possible new venues i mean we have encounter possibilities and new venues of addressing probably you have already set up in the clark and the isu i guess is the one that is latent with meaning right now for for the future but i mean i i i will say that the one on otero is also very 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 fertile with with new directions i i will say that the one on, on alessandro valteo you know how we met you know is well, also latent with with enormous promises so i would like to hear a little bit about about all the other ones Yeah, I mean, this book is, I mean, you said, you were the one who said it's a self-archaeology, but when I read the book, sometimes I'm a little embarrassed because it's like, kind of like my history too. It's yeah. like you in 2008 because yeah. you commissioned one of the texts and then this and that, you know, and so yeah, yeah. Um, there's there's something kind of quite rewarding about that. Um, what, okay, so I think one other, let's say, intellectual provocation of the book, which is not stated as such, is that I include Dejanita, who's basically a self-taught artist, but I don't make big to-do about her being a mm -hmm. self-taught artist. Because, you know, at the end of the day, modernism, at least, you know, in Brazil, it was like absolutely, you know, traffic between the self-taught and, you know, what we consider, you know, modernist artists in the United States. There was a lot of interchange between those, you know, and, and, you know, Dejanita won the Guggenheim the same year as Lucia Clark, right? And so mm -hmm. I think that there's a way in which, you know, I kind of included her um, as also testimony to that to that different history, right? That modernism mm -hmm. is, is kind of much more inclusive. It doesn't mean that, you know, you just wouldn't have Greenberg in the United States writing about either psychiatric patients art or self-taught artists necessarily, right? And, and you mm -hmm. have that in the Brazilian case very strongly. And um, and so I think that that is another avenue in terms of thinking about, you know, and I have colleagues who are going to be working on questions of arte popular, right? Mm -hmm. and, and really There is a level of there is a level of porosity, you know, yes. in, in Latin America, you know, that at least in, in in the Brazilian context that allows to have those ins and outs out of what they were could, I mean, strict modernism parameters were, you know. Right. I mean, And I think that people are, are turning now also in some instances to that kind of porosity, right? Mm -hmm. and, and being, and so I think that that's going to be something interesting uh, to think about in terms of how that, you know, modernism is narrated when, you know, when it's taught in the United States. So, I mean, that mm -hmm. was for me, I mean, you mentioned my, you know, moving to Brazil, you know, when I, being there, I didn't want to replicate what I already learned in grad school. I wanted to understand what the hell was going on in Brazil, right? And 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 learning from madness was very much, and, and my present research came out of that porosity between understanding that um, Mario Pedrosa, his final years, was working at the psychiatric hospital at Museo de Imagen de Inconsciente, right? Yeah. I mean, what does it mean for the major art critic to end up working at the, you know, the Cadric Hospital, <laughs> yeah, yeah, hospital museum? And so, yeah. so that porosity is something that I think I really thrive on and um, enjoy um, thinking about. And um, you know, at this point, I just want to like Mac. I want to work on what I want to work on, and and, yeah. have, and I feel that this book, I mean, Vitalities, is probably more art historical than I usually am. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. But that's a but that's a wonderful way of 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 of, of retiring from our history, as you have just said. You know? <laughs> exactly. I mean, it, uh, it, it it just wraps it up. I they are telling me that we don't have any more time. Um, um, but first of all, I, I again once more congratulations. Second, please go buy the book. Um, it is it is needed for your libraries and it's it's going to be important for for anyone who teaches like like us who teach Latin American art. Um, you really are like, you know, um, I mean, uh, a beacon in this, you know, Kyra. So I really, we we thank you and I thank you personally for being in this in this conversation. And I hope to, um, I will pass it to, to Jesus to- um, Well, let me just thank you too, because you're a big part of that book and you're a big you. part of my conversations. And thank so, you, you know, without you. my colleagues and friends like you, this, this wouldn't be what it is. 
So. Thank you. So thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. And um, Jesus, to you. That was uh, <clears throat> uh, an amazing conversation. Thank you so much for uh, for doing it. Um, was Kaira uh, did a, a great job. It was very interesting and always uh, bringing uh, fresh fresh ideas about uh, very complex uh, issues. Uh, well, uh, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, Islas. Thank you, um, Ariel Asics for uh, supporting uh, Latin American art, uh, art history uh, research. And I hope to see you soon. <laughs>